stories for the people that joined earlier. Uh, I'm an amateur astronomer with some background in science, ultimately a career uh, in the computer industry, which is uh, in many ways very related uh, to modern astronomy, uh, digital astrophotography and such. Um, but it's been a lifelong pursuit and I'm a member of the Los Angeles Astronomical Society and we're the group that uh, do the star parties up at uh, Griffith Park Observatory, if you ever go up there. Uh, we do the public star party out on the lawn. We also operate about three observatories around Southern California, as well as uh, doing star parties at schools and stuff. So it's been a lifelong interest. I know a fair amount about telescopes and I've been uh, teaching this badge for about, I think, six years now. So welcome, that's who I am. Uh, you have our email addresses and we'll get started here. So just by way of uh, sort of ground rules, you guys are mostly gonna stay on mute. If I ask you for some questions and you wanna try some answers, you can type them into chat or raise your hand. Uh, and uh, if you do have a question or something, um, Carolyn, my wife who's sitting right there, uh, will see you and uh, she can chat back or uh, ask me the question and we'll get that answered. So uh, the reason you're here, in addition to an interest in astronomy, is to earn a merit badge. So we're gonna cover the ground rules on that real quick before we start the presentation. I do want every one of you to earn the badge. It's not nothing, it is a significant badge. You know, it's not just, you know, sitting and listening to some guy talk. Uh, we are gonna have a break and you're gonna go outside. We're gonna do some live viewing and give you some other resources. Um, so to earn the merit badge, that's what you wanna accomplish tonight. So I'm gonna kind of give you the ground rules for that. Um, we require that you read the merit badge booklet. It's going to have the answer to almost every single question in the workbook. So it's a resource for you if you're trying to fill out one section or another or you didn't catch an answer in, uh, in the lecture. So uh, in order to uh, earn the badge, what it boils down to is you complete all the requirements and record that in the workbook, which is uh, I emailed everyone on the call. Uh, as we go through tonight, you can jot down uh, quick answers to, to, to the things that either you think of or we talk about when the topic comes up and you'll have 90% of it done. There are three prerequisites that we can't do tonight. Uh, and we'll be talking about how you will accomplish those, but that's your uh, moon drawings. The moon drawings are a little hard right now because the moon is uh, rising at like 2 a.m. Uh, so if you wanna do moon drawings, you're gonna have to get up very early in the morning. Or draw it at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, yep. <laughs> and uh, uh, also there's a couple others, uh, the drawing of the face of the moon. There's some stuff in the scout book you can do or get, get the online to draw some craters and stuff. So we'll go over those prerequisites, but those you have to do on your own. All the rest of them will, uh, everything else we'll cover in here. This whole three hour session counts as the star party and the final requirement, uh, because we're gonna be doing almost an hour of live viewing and talking about astronomy the whole time like we would at a star party. Of course, if we were meeting at the observatory, this would be more like a live star party and there would be uh, the dome to go up in and then we would have telescopes out on the lawn. So like I said before, we're gonna invite you to that once we're open again. And if you have continued, continued interest in astronomy uh, and you'd like to come out to a scout day uh, when we're open and we'll make special arrangements uh, for you individually, your patrol or your troop to come visit us. Uh, that would probably be best at Monterey Park, but we can also do tours up at Mount Wilson and you could also meet us up at Griffith Park Observatory. So there's lots of ways that you can stay connected to, uh, to what's going on in astronomy. So once you fill out the workbook, uh, you're gonna fill out you know, every single requirement uh, and what you did and uh, <clears throat> you know, what the answers are we discussed. Um, there are no necessarily right answers. In many cases, we'll be just chatting about the answers. Uh, and unfortunately, our YouTube recording is not gonna work. So I'll post the slides for you. And if you have any questions, just email me or my wife, Carolyn. So let's, uh, uh, once you email me a copy of your workbook, uh, if you're doing, you're filling out the online fillable thing. Uh, be sure and save your work. I, I had a scout in the last session that filled out his whole workbook and then emailed it to me without saving it. And he emailed me a blank workbook. And that was really unfortunate because he had to redo it. Once I get your filled out workbook, uh, you know, if you have any drawings, you can do them right in the workbook. That's part of the prerequisites. And uh, just email me the whole thing. I'll uh, check through it. And then I will email you back a filled out blue card that you will get your scout leader to sign and that's all you need. Uh, and uh, so, uh,
if uh, if you would like to get a physical blue card, the actual blue card instead of a scam, uh, send me your physical address uh, and I will mail you the actual blue card with my portion detached so that you can put that in your binder. Also, I have an account on scoutbook.com. So if you would like uh, to have your merit badge registered at scoutbook.com, uh, please uh, let me know and I'll go in there on your troop and I'll register you in there. So uh, that covers it about it. Um, if you miss anything tonight or you have to go to bed early or whatever, feel free to email back and uh, uh, join the class next week or in August. Um, you're welcome uh, to join in a later class if you need uh, some more help filling out your workbook. So uh, uh, great. So that's kind of the preliminaries uh, tonight. The intro is done. Uh, I'm going to do a quick demo of the uh, of the sky map, and uh, then we're going to start it on the PowerPoint. So a little bit about sky maps first. So let me stop this. Well, maybe I can do it here. Yeah. Okay. And oh, where do I have? Oh, here we go. Oh, right. You can't see that. I got to share it. So I emailed you guys a, a, a July sky map and zoom, share. Where is my astronomy merit badge, astronomy merit badge. Here we go. Okay, so you guys should have this in front of you. Hopefully you uh, printed it out. This is a really simple sky chart. And as you know, the sky moves around at night, right? Every 24 hours, it rotates around the sky like a giant uh, disc. Uh, and uh, so you have to get a different map for each month because uh, both as the Earth goes around and spins around every 24 hours, and as the Earth goes around the sun, what constellations you can see changes so a little sky map like this like if you're going on a camp out or something uh then you could just go print out a sky map for that night uh, obviously the way that you use these sky maps and there's actually some information on the front and back of this that are really useful and it shows the constellations uh and i'm going to point out a few features to this sky map that are going to help you fill out your requirements so obviously constellations and star names are important and a lot of sky maps have that on it so you would hold the map and face in the direction at the bottom of the map. So the bottom of this map says south. So if you were to hold the map in front of you and face south, that's towards San Diego with the mountains at your back, or if you've oriented yourself to the North Star, that's gonna be with the back, with the uh, North Star at your back, uh, you would uh, then see the constellations from the horizon up above you and behind you. And this is the orientation they would be at around eight or 9 p.m. in the evening. If you try to use this sky map at midnight, it's gonna look a little different. And I'm gonna show you some other sky maps uh, uh, with that. And uh, so uh, a couple of things here. First of all, uh, you can see that there's a blue like stripe across the center of the map. That's the Milky Way. And uh, as you know, the Milky Way is a galaxy. It's our galaxy. and the milkiness or the white that you see, which you can't see in the city because the city lights are shine up into the sky, bounce off the pollution clouds, uh, smog and air vapor. And that, that shine in the sky at night uh, is brighter than the Milky Way. So if you wanna see the Milky Way across the sky, you may have seen it when you were out camping in the desert, I highly recommend that. Or if you go up into the mountains uh, and get into a darker place, it, the Milky Way is painted across the sky in a big stripe, and it looks like a, a milky white path. That's why it's called the Milky Way. Uh, as you can see in the southern part of this map, um, you'll see the teapot Sagittarius. You'll see uh, also Scorpius and his tail hooked around there in the bottom of the map. Uh, so you see that big bulge uh, in the Milky Way there? That's towards the center. And right near Sagittarius there is the center of the Milky Way galaxy. It's like a giant wheel in the sky and we're offset to one side. As you stare in towards the bulge at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, 
uh, you're looking in the direction of Sagittarius A, which is the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And that stripe uh, of the Milky Way circles all the way around the sky all the time because we're sitting in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. So you can use a sky map like this to navigate around. Uh, obviously, if you look uh, up to the north in Ursa Major, you will see the Big Dipper, which is kind of in the upper right center area. And there's the little pointer stars to Polaris. Polaris is at the end of the handle of Ursa Minor. And that's a really important star, Polaris. It's the pole star. It's the star around which the sky rotates at night every 24 hours. It's actually not the sky that's rotating, of course. It's the Earth. So as the stars move around the sky in a circle every night around Polaris, uh, every 24 hours, they return back to their original position. So if you come back the next night and the next night. Now, the sky does change a little bit from night to night, and that is because in addition to the Earth spinning around, it's also moving around the sun, and you're looking out into the galaxy, uh, into intergalactic space uh, at different positions during the year. So uh, I do want to show you uh, these little printed out ones. This is my star map and it actually spins around so I can set it to a particular time. And one this size has a lot more detail for why I use my telescope. So it has galaxies and uh, nebula and all kinds of clusters and stuff marked on it. So I use this as a map, just the way you would use a map if you were hiking or camping to find things in the sky. There's one other dotted line I want to point out to you. If you look, starting, um, over there by uh, the ecliptic, there's a dashed line in a curved crescent from the left side all the way to the right side. That's called the ecliptic. And that's the, that's the line across the sky that represents our solar system. Our solar system is also a disk. So all the planets, the moon, the sun, they all travel across the sky in that dotted path. So if you'll look right to the left of Sagittarius near the center of the Milky Way galaxy on your star map, you'll see the ecliptic and you'll see a little thing that says Jupiter. So in fact, tonight when you go out to view, if you will orient towards the south, locate Sagittarius, uh, Taurus, and then look just to the left, you'll see a bright sky, a light in the sky that looks like a plane. That's gonna be the planet Jupiter and it's one of the observing objects I want you to, to shoot for tonight. So this sky map is also showing you what planets are gonna be visible. And if you have good vision or a dark sky, you'll notice about two hands to the left of Jupiter is the planet Saturn, which is much smaller in the sky. Not because Saturn is small, Saturn is absolutely gigantic, but it's very, very far away. So it appears a little bit smaller. In a telescope, you can see the rings and, and all the moons and stuff of Saturn, which is a really cool view. Uh, I will show you, if you do make it out to our observatory on a scout night, uh, I've got one for you. Uh, so that's the gift you'll be getting, which is a uh, planisphere to, uh, I help you with your observing. So that's a little bit about sky maps. Uh, there are some really, really cool modern phone apps that help you navigate around the night sky. They're pretty neat to find things, uh, and I have no objection to them, but you really don't learn where things are. Like if you don't have your phone with you or you know it's not working or whatever, you, you actually don't know where anything is. So I, I do kind of encourage you to uh, use your sky map to find things. And we'll be using them tonight uh, when we go out and look at the night sky. So let's go back to uh, our presentation. Okay. So that's all of that. Okay, so now we're starting on the requirements. So I'm just gonna jump in and we're gonna go uh, kind of blazing fast. Let me get out my, uh, my worksheet. We're gonna start with number one. Uh, which is hazards on every, almost every merit badge, probably including library science has. What are the hazards of library science? Astronomy is not a particularly hazardous thing to do, but there are a few things to be cautious about and things that uh, you should take note of. Uh, as you will think about it, astronomy takes place at night. Obviously, uh, when the sun is out, we can't see all the, the stars and stuff. And uh, the uh, uh, so you're at dark, you're often, uh, at night, you're outside. Uh, so there are some hazards there. So I'm gonna list a few, feel free. Uh, your merit badge book uh, lists a few others. Um, so 
you know, obviously if you're outdoors in the darkness or you're high altitude or you're in the desert at night, you're going to want to have proper clothing. It's standard scouting stuff. Um, and uh, altitude, a lot of astronomy, a lot of stuff is at high altitude. Um, so you could get altitude sickness. Um, I think the most common injury I have seen related to astronomy is what I call stumbling around in, in, injuries. And what that means is people are stumbling around in the dark and uh, uh, they trip on things and, and they fall over. So you get twisted ankles and uh, you know jammed fingers and that sort of stuff. Uh, so how do you prevent those? A couple of things. Uh, one is just be careful. Use a red light. We'll be talking about using red lights uh, so that you can see where you're going and not walk into telescopes and that sort of thing. Uh, how to treat. These are standard first aid things, just like your second and first class stuff. Uh, they're mostly going to be minor injuries or if there's a little bit of bleeding, you would control the bleeding. Uh, make, uh, make sure that there's no shock or broken bones or anything like that. Uh, and if it's a serious injury, uh, you know, reassure the person and, and get help. Um, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, there is a few cases of astronomers in the old days working in high altitudes like in Chile or up on Mount Wilson in the cold of winter where you, you can't heat the dome of an observatory. It would ruin the viewing through infrared radiation. So astronomers would have to sit on chairs high in the dome in freezing cold weather and uh, that, would, uh, that could result in uh, illness and in some cases uh, death. I think uh, there was one case of an astronomer falling off of a chair uh, in the dome and getting injured. So there, there are a few ways that you could get injured. I do want to point out that we don't do astronomy during the day. It seems perfectly obvious. If you look at, if you can, uh, if you try to look at the sun, you will damage the retina of your eyes um, permanently. Uh, so don't let people do that. Even if it's a, an eclipse or something really cool, you, you have to protect your eyes. Use a pinhole camera to, uh, which just means, you know, a box or something with a pinhole cut in it and then, you know, shine the image of the eclipse onto a white board or wall or something. Well, if you do, if you do have a correct, uh, correctly graded commercial filter, like the little sun glasses, you can use those not directly at the sun, uh, but during the eclipse itself, you can uh, take them off. Uh, but yeah, be real careful in, in daytime viewing. I also want to point out, I see a lot of people uh, in astronomy using uh, the five watt green laser pointers. Um, those are technically illegal. And I, you know, if you point them at planes or something, you're violating federal law. Uh, I, I'm a little more concerned. Uh, those lasers are powerful enough to damage the retina of your eyes and people just play with them like they're lightsabers. So uh, I recommend not using them. Just point with your hand and uh, don't use the green lasers. If you do see someone using a green laser, I highly recommend you caution to put it away if there's uh, people around. Uh, they are pretty cool to point at things in the sky, so if someone's using one safely, maybe you don't have to get too excited about it, but uh, be really careful with, uh, with those laser pointers. So that's about it for hazards. Uh, you know, we're going to dress warm, we're gonna use red light uh, uh, to avoid stumbling around injuries. Um, if someone gets altitude sickness, uh, you're going to provide them rest and move her to a lower uh, altitude and let them breathe normally to get their oxygen levels back up. Uh, if it's a situation where they get overheated, which seems unlikely in astronomy, your standard first aid for, uh, for heat, which is, you know, get them into, into shade and get them something to drink and uh, monitor them and contact authorities. So those are ways I, you know, there's a few other things. Dehydration is to sip some water bites and stings. There's some stuff like that in your workbook. You can list those if you want. They seem pretty uncommon, but astronomy is outdoors. If you're out in the desert and you, you know you mess with a snake, you could get bitten. So feel free to put that in your packet. Uh, we talked about proper clothing with layers and gloves, and I wear a beanie because I'm often out in the dark uh, looking at stuff. Um, and it says here, uh, explain how to safely observe the sun on objects near the sun and the moon. Uh, Obviously, we do not look directly at them either with our eyes or with any telescope or binoculars. Uh, the only safe way to do that is with an approved commercial solar filter. Uh, and you can use indirect uh, uh, projection methods, which are pretty cool. If there's a, you know, a lunar eclipse uh, or a solar eclipse, 
uh, you can build a little pinhole camera and uh, do a little projection and people can gather around that. That's pretty cool. Um, okay, so that's it for astronomy hazards that, that I have to say. The most common one I see is stumbling around, first aid type injuries, uh, cuts, bruises, turned ankles, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, we use our standard first aid treatments for those. Okay, so I'm gonna move on from number one uh, and hopefully you've got some notes. You can do that in the workbook. Going on to number two, uh, light pollution. So uh, you guys, uh, there is a uh, picture of LA there from Mount Wilson. You can imagine uh, all of those lights, every car, every street light, every everything uh, are shining lights into the sky. Uh, and it's a form of pollution. And while it isn't particularly hazardous to our health directly, uh, it does spoil the view of our night sky. And I also just want you to think like we burn train loads of coal every day to make all that light. So all that light that our cities are lit up with and all the air conditioners that we run and all the stuff that, that pollutes the sky with light also generates the kind of air pollution that makes people sick. So it's really a waste to be shining all this light and they're making newer kinds of lights that don't shine up in the sky and use a lot less electricity. And I'm a big fan of that because uh, when I was your guys' age, I could go out of my backyard and I could see all the visible planets in the Milky Way. And uh, now I live here in LA and you can barely see the brightest stars at night. So I, I think that's uh, something that we should be cognizant of and, and that we shouldn't be uh, wasting all this energy to pour light up into the, uh, the night sky. What effect does it have on telescopes? Um, well, that light pollution, as I told you, shines light up into the sky and it creates a, a background of, of glow uh, and you can't see anything. The, the stars and the dimmer galaxies and the Milky Way, they're washed out by it. So you just can't see the night sky. When we, uh, when we go do star parties at schools and we set up our telescopes, many of these uh, uh, elementary school kids they've never seen a planet at all. They've never seen a, the Milky Way or anything in the sky. They just live in LA and they think the sky is just this blank kind of gray thing. So uh, the effect that light pollution has directly on astronomy is it spoils the view of the night sky. And it, it, some of our finest observatories in the United States uh, are no longer uh, usable because of this. So it, it, is, it is a harm to science and it is a shame and it is wasteful. So I am not a fan of light pollution. Uh, sky, go, sky glow specifically is all that wasted light from you know used car lots and 7-Elevens and street lights uh, shining up into the sky. It hits little particles of dust, smog, uh, cloud, condensation, atmosphere and uh, it creates a sky glow uh, that, that blocks out our view. Um, so uh, sky glow is uh, uh, light pollution shining into the sky and blocking our view of the sky. And air pollution, uh, air pollution, direct air pollution, that is the, the actual smog and stuff, significantly degrades astronomy. So the finest astronomy is done at high altitudes and remote locations. And uh, you know places like Mauna Kea in Hawaii and down in Chile, um, but uh, up until the last few decades, Mount Wilson up in Pasadena was one of the premier observatories of the world with the 100 inch. And while it still conducts some research, um, because of the light pollution in LA, it can never be really quite the instrument it once was, which is a shame. So uh, light pollution is. Uh, uh, all the light that humans generate uh, shining up in the sky and spoiling our view of the night sky. So that's number two, pretty easy one, covered in the Merit Badge book. And uh, that's just my, uh, my take on it, but you should get the, the answer in there for that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about astronomical instruments. We'll be taking a break after number five, I believe, and I'll do a demo of the telescopes. Um, but there are, two basic kinds of telescopes. And I really want you to kind of learn this. There's a refractor and a reflector. Um, and they're just two different kinds of telescopes. The picture on your screen is a refractor. And you'll notice that the refractor has a blue disc of glass in the front of it, like binoculars do. And that is a curved piece of glass called a lens 
Uh, it works exactly like a magnifying glass. Uh, in essence, it bends the light and concentrates the light, thus allowing your eye to, to see the light as if your eye were, you know, five inches across instead of a quarter of an inch. So refractors depend on the refraction of light, that is light shining through a primary objective curved piece of glass. And most of, when you guys think of telescopes, you know, long narrow tubes that you look through one end and you point the other end up at the sky, those are refractors. If you're not sure, um, you know, just look in the front and you'll see a curved piece of glass and go, oh, well, this is a refractor because it has a curved piece of glass, a primary lens in the front of it. Uh, the light comes in from the front of the telescope, hits the primary lens, bends a little bit into a cone, concentrating the light from the sky into the eyepiece where there's another little tiny lens that straightens it out and allows you to see a, a greatly magnified view of the sky, uh, enhancing the light and contrast uh, of, you know, that your normal eye can see. So that's a refractor, and that's the first kind of telescope. Um, a reflector is a completely different animal. A reflector does not use curved glass or a magnifying lens. A reflector uses a mirror. So the light shines through the front of the telescope, hits a curved mirror in the bottom, bounces that light back up, and then a secondary uh, angle mirror shoots the light out the side of the telescope. So I'll do a demo of that, but you can always tell a reflector because when you look down the front of it, you're going to see uh, a big mirror. And, and all the big, all the telescopes, the, the big research telescopes in the world are now reflectors. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is a reflector. It has a big mirror in the bottom of it, like a light bucket. Uh, my personal 10-inch uh, uh, telescope uh, is a reflector. The 100 inch on Mount Wilson and the 200 inch at Mount Palomar here in Southern California uh, are reflectors. They, they do not have a curved piece of glass in front of them. Uh, so there is a third type of telescope called a catadioptric, uh, um, which is also called a Cassegrain, which is a fat stubby tube that has a corrector plate in the front and a mirror in the back. So it's kind of a hybrid refractor reflector. Um, so, uh, and you see those sometimes, if you see a uh, fat stubby telescope, um, you can say, oh, I know that, that's a, that's a schmidt Cassegrain. it's a catadioptric. Um, so you see those two. Um, telescopes are often placed on mounts uh, so that you can spin them around and look at different things. There are two, two basic kinds of mounts. The first kind is a polar or equatorial mount. And what that means is if you look at the picture on your screen of the refractor, it's on a little mount that has a spinning bar and some counterweights. The reason that that thing is tilted up and that mount spins around in that direction is uh, you can rotate that scope in unison with the sky moving and stay on an object without having to move the telescope. So a polar or equatorial mount has the mount tilted up so it's pointed at the North Star, and as you spin the uh, scope around that axis, it tracks the circular motion of the stars in the sky. So a polar or equatorial mount is an excellent tracking scope because all you have to do is rotate the scope around that axis, and it's going to stay on whatever you've pointed it at. The other type of uh, a mount is uh, uh, an altitude azimuth. And if you just think about this, it's, it's you know, just... Uh, the, the, the angle up from the horizon and then a 360 around. It's just up and down, left and right. That's just a basic non-equatorial mount. And my Dobsonian I'm gonna show you is an alt as mount. Uh, and so Dobsonian is a famous sidewalk mount. It is a form of alt as mounts as well. Uh, so binoculars, which is in your workbook. Uh, binoculars are a form of refracting telescope. Uh, uh, binoculars have two primary objectives. It's like two little telescopes side by side, but because the objective lenses are bigger around than your eyeballs, you can't, if you tried to put them like this, uh, they would be too close together. So as you can see in your workbook or in your merit badge book, the light path for a binocular has a couple of angled mirrors to uh, bring the light a little closer together for how your eyes work. And then there's a little swivel bar that lets you uh, 
uh, swivel the binoculars to fit the exact distance between your eyes. So binoculars are just two refracting telescopes side by side that you look through with both eyes simultaneously. And you can see some great stuff with binoculars. I'll show you that in the demo. Um, so let's see, what do we got here? Uh, explain why binoculars and telescopes are important astronomical tools. Well, uh, as we were discussing, it allows you to magnify or gather more light, uh, which allows you to see faint objects much more distinctly, which allows you to magnify them. So if you put in a magnifying eyepiece and you're gathering more light, you can make out much more detail, say on the moon or the surface of a planet or details of a faint nebula or galaxy, or even uh, trying to look at a star system. Stars are just points of light, but even in uh, 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 binoculars, you can see color, and the color of a star tells us a lot about it. We'll talk about that later. So uh, we're, uh, I think we're down to 3A, demonstrate. Let's see, do we have anything more? Uh, yeah, there's a few more things here. So I'll do the demo at the end of three here. Uh, uh, demonstrate or explain how these tools are used. So I'll do the demo. You guys can cre cre create notes, but let's do the rest of these uh, B, C, and D, and then we'll do the then we'll do the demo. Okay. So describe the similarities and differences of several types of astronomical telescopes. So you want to put refractor, um, and refractors use curved glass or lenses, and they provide high contrast, uh, which is uh, really good for a small diameter telescope. Uh, reflectors, which are very, very large mirrors, uh, are much bigger typically. You can make a much bigger mirror, so you can gather a lot more light. So reflectors are much better at looking at faint objects. So like if you wanted to look at a uh, globular cluster or a faint galaxy, you would probably want lots of aperture, which means big around, and the reflectors are best at that. So a reflector is going to be a little bit lower contrast, but it is going to be able to gather enough light to see faint objects. Um, obviously, uh, uh, schmidt cassegrains are kind of in the middle there. Uh, they do both, so they're kind of hybrid. And schmidt cassegrains are the most popular high-end astronomy, amateur astronomy ones. You go to star parties, you'll see a lot of schmidt cassegrains because they're relatively easy to operate. They have fairly large aperture and they have good contrast. So if you're interested in buying a telescope, a small Schmidt Cassegrain, a catadioptric, it can be a really good compromise for looking at just about anything. Um, okay, explain the purposes of at least three instruments used with astronomical telescopes. Uh, so uh, what they mean here is what kind of things do you attach to telescopes uh, or instruments Right. I suppose one answer might be an eyepiece so you can look at it with your eye, right? If you can't look through a telescope unless you put an eyepiece on there. So you can put list that if you want. But there are some other things I want to list. You'll see on the slide um, that uh, there's a radio telescope. That's a different kind of telescope. But there, let's see, see explain the purpose of like three instruments. So you'll see some of this in the demos. Um, most telescopes have a finder scope mounted on it. That's the little one at the back that helps you find things. So finder scope, you might, instead of uh, an eyepiece, put a camera on the back. That would be called astrophotography. Um, and you might also put a, uh, a prism to split the light up into its various colors. And that's going to tell you a lot about where the light came from and what, what was the source of the light. Remember, when you split the colors of light into its various constituent components, it can tell you a lot about what elements uh, uh, that light came from. So this is how we tell what stars are made out of, right? <coughs> so there's some answers, a star finder, an astrophotography camera, or uh, uh, maybe a, a spectroscope to uh, split the light and look at the different colors. And, and, and spectrograph is a really fancy name for prism, which is what you do to split light into its rainbow colors. And those colors and their distribution tell you the source of the light. So those are uh, purposes. There's lots of other kinds of instruments that people attach to, uh, to telescopes as well. Uh, proper care and storage. Uh, obviously you wanna keep them uh, out of the direct sunlight in their proper storage box or case. 
You wanna keep eye cups to protect the uh, mirrors and lenses. If you don't do these things, you'll scratch up or uh, get dust on your mirror or lenses and that will mess up your view. So after a night of astronomy, uh, obviously putting your gear away carefully and using its proper storage containers. Uh, otherwise, it won't last very long and your, your lens will get scratched up or your mirror will get dust on it and it just won't be the same. Uh, so uh, if you want it to last, if you want it to work, you know, I mean, if, you're, if you were to go into a career in astronomy and your career depended on using your astronomical instruments night after night, you would obviously want to take care of them because if they degrade, they have to be cleaned and they won't work. So um, proper care is so that they will function and last properly and they won't be damaged. Okay, so uh, I think with that, uh, we said to do some demos. So um, I think we'll do our demo now before we get started on the next slide. So uh, I'm gonna stop sharing and Carolyn, you're gonna take us over to our demo area. Hi guys, I'm going to go over to the demo area now. All right, I think the logistics of that is I need you to turn off your mic. Turn off my mic? Why did I need to do that? And mute your... Oh, okay. And... Uh, Spencer? Uh... I actually need to have my camera be the one that's talking. Let me turn down my sound. Well, I can't get Spencer off. Well, just muted. No, he is muted. <laughs> okay, we got logistics issues going on here. Okay, well, if you can see uh, the demo, try to make this, uh, this screen big because this is where I'm going to be demoing this stuff. All right. No. It worked last time. No, I'm just going to have to have a bunch of little postage stamps. I mean, I got you on the camera, but okay. Speak loudly and okay. All right. Well, that I hope you guys can see that uh, the picture bigger. Um, uh, here I am with my uh, telescope and a few demo items for you. I'll try and hold them up. I'm putting my hand on my telescope. You can see me moving it right now. This is a 10 inch reflector. That means the mirror is 10 inches in diameter. Um, and it's an alt as mount. So it spins around the sky this way and up and down this way. So this is an alt as mount with a reflecting telescope. What that means is down here in the base, I'm pointing at the base down here, there is a curved mirror uh, and Curved mirror means exactly what you think. It's a little mirror like this, right? And so you guys see that? You see how it magnifies stuff? This is a curved mirror, it's not flat. So my telescope has a curved mirror just like that, only bigger in the bottom. So the light comes in from the front of the telescope, travels down to the bottom, hits the curved mirror, bounces back up, and here in the front, there is a, a angled mirror called the secondary mirror that, that reflects the light out the side of the telescope. And here's the eyepiece right here where you would see the view in the telescope. And I have a big two inch eyepiece on here, which is great for looking at uh, things like the moon and larger objects. Uh, this is a pretty good sized uh, telescope. It gets very good resolution on all kinds of things. Uh, it's obviously not as big as, uh, you know, the Mount Wilson 100 inch, which is 10 times larger and many times greater in light gathering. You will notice there's some extra instruments on my telescope. This is a finder scope. This is actually a 50 millimeter telescope. Can you see that? Uh, so this is a tiny little telescope in its own right. This helps me find things in the sky to point my big telescope at because looking at the sky through this telescope is like looking at the sky through a coffee stirrer. It's really hard to find things because you're looking at such a tiny patch of sky. So I use this finder scope and this Telrad heads up viewer here uh, to help me find things in the sky. I know where they are, but it can be pretty hard to find if you can't lock onto something. So this telescope does not have a, a polar tracking. That means if you point it at something 
and you wait one minute, whatever it is, is just going to move out of view because the Earth keeps rotating. If you want a, a, a telescope that tracks objects in the sky, you have to have a big fork mount that will turn the telescope in unison with the Earth and keep it pointed at stuff. Uh, if you have a, uh, a refractor, you can have, uh, you'll see a, a polar mount and it'll be, there'll be a clock drive and a counterweight and it'll spin your telescope in unison with the sky. Uh, so a few other things, when we talk about a refractor, of course, this is a magnifying glass that's got a piece of, see how it's magnifying things? That's what you see in the front of a refractor. It refracts the light by going through a curved lens. So here are my sky binoculars. They're a little bit bigger than regular binoculars. Uh, regular binoculars, by the way, work great for uh, beginners. They're really, really cool. Uh, but these are a little bit larger, so they gather a bit more light, and I can see stuff on the moon and things like that with these. So these are 9 by 63 with a little more magnification. But if you look in the front right there are two pieces of curved glass. So this really is two telescopes side by side um, and refracting telescopes. So the only problem with binoculars is you need a place to rest your elbows because it's really hard to keep things in the sky still. It'll wobble around on you really easy. So a lot of times when I really want to use my binoculars, I'll just find a nice grassy spot. I'll lay on my back and just look up like that because it's a little easier than uh, trying to hold them up like that. You can get a tripod for binoculars, which can be another cool thing to use with binoculars. And you can see the Andromeda galaxy and some star clusters and planets in binoculars. So you can see some cool stuff. Uh, we talked about eyepieces. Here are some eyepieces. These go uh, in the eyepiece at the back of the telescope or in a reflector up near the front. And this is what makes the light visible to the human eye. And different eyepieces are going to give you different magnification. Now, why not magnify it as much as possible? The more you magnify light, the less resolution you get and the more blurry the image. So there's a balance between how much light you're gathering, how good your focus is, what eyepiece you're using, to get the best possible of you uh, with clarity. So that's what eyepieces are for. They let you look through the telescope. Um, here's a basic telescope. This is an instrument for a star party. We talked about light pollution. We don't want light pollution anywhere around telescopes because the human eye uh, reacts to bright light. So if you shine a flashlight at a star party, that is a social faux pas. You have just ruined everyone's night vision and all the astronomers are gonna be mad at you. So I use a red light, can you see that? That's red, this is white. See the difference? So white light will cause your pupil to contract and will actually hurt your night vision. So I bought a little LED flashlight, it's not very expensive, but it has a red button so I can use red light. If you get a headlamp, get one that has a red setting. You don't have that, you can just put a little piece of red cellophane on front of your flashlight. So you can see that makes a little bit of red light and won't spoil anyone's vision. So those are uh, uh, things for observing. Um, I got a couple other things. Here's my headlamp. When scouts do this, when I'm using my telescope, if they go up to me and they do this, that's terrible because it ruins my night vision and I hate it. So my headlamp has a red light setting. And whenever you look through telescopes and you need light, you're always going to want to use a dim red light. So I always take a compass with me in case I don't know which direction north is or I can't see Polaris. And that's a standard scout compass that helps me find which way is north. And this is my astrophotography digital camera. It's a tiny thing. It goes, it's designed to fit in the back of a te telescope. This is a 20 megapixel light gathering astronomical telescope camera and what it does is you can run an exposure for like an hour and that gathers a lot more light so you can see things like the arms of spiral galaxies that the human eye couldn't even see even in the telescope so astrophotography digital cameras tracking cameras they can hugely increase the detail that we see um, and you could take some really cool images and see them. Um, and we're gonna do that tonight with Spencer. So that is my astrophotography camera. It's a pretty good one. It was pretty expensive. Um, of course, high-end ones cost thousands of dollars. This one didn't cost nearly that much, 
but I've gotten some really great images from this little camera and I really enjoy it. Uh, so I think that's about it for demos. I will say that uh, there's lots of good books in astronomy. I can send you some links. You know, I have little books on astronomy. Uh, if you decide Sky and Telescope is the right magazine, uh, it includes articles about what's going on in rockets and science and history uh, of, of science. It also contains the monthly viewing guide so that you know what's in the night sky. Uh, if there's anything cool like a comet or an eclipse or whatever, it'll be covered in that month's Sky and Telescope and you'll know when and where to go look at things. So uh, if you continue to have an interest in astronomy, uh, subscription to Science Sky and Telescope magazine uh, it only costs about $20 a year and you'll get a lot of enjoyment about it if this is a hobby you're interested in doing. If you uh, can get a copy of this month's Sky and Telescope before you go on a camp out, you'll have a chance to really impress your troop by all the things you'll be able to point out that night. And again, the monthly sky viewing chart and where the planets are and all that stuff uh, are in the monthly Sky and Telescope. So I, I use that a lot. I love the articles. Okay, so that's it for the demo. If you have any questions, let me go back over here. I'm going to re-enable my mic. All right. I'm off. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. So that takes us up through uh, number th one, two, and three. Uh, if you've got good notes, uh, you're done with those. If you need to circle back and read your merit badge book and fill them out, you don't have to me email me your workbook, you know, tomorrow. If you need an extra couple days to finish filling it out, that's fine. Uh, but don't send me a partial. You're going for the whole thing. Fill it all out. Send it to me and get the badge. You'll, you'll be happy that you did. So we're going to go on to number four. If you have any questions uh, about the stuff we demoed or any questions about how to fill out your workbook, or what to do with it, just type them in the chat and uh, we'll get you an answer uh, straight away. So I'm gonna move on to number four in the presentation. Yeah. How about we take a five minute break? Um, okay. Uh, if you guys wanna take a, a quick break, uh, I'll get a drink of water and uh, come back in five minutes and then we'll start with number four, okay? <laughs> 